really appreciate being here uh, in memory of Cynthia Longfellow and the wonderful uh, talk I just had with some of the, uh, the staff uh, here at the John Belton Institute. Uh, uh, this is a special university. I have to tell you that I was with my older son, who I write about in the book, right? both my sons and both my old son, Jason, just a few hours ago in New York. He was on his way back from um, India and Nepal. And uh, at 27, he no longer asked our permission to go to India and Nepal. <laughs> I, I still want him to stay in his room, you know, and not, <laughs> not go out of town, but um, I've lost that. Uh, uh, and he applied to Sarah Lawrence and was accepted to come here. And uh, he ended up going to UC Santa Cruz <clears throat> because he wanted a conservative college. Uh, <laughs> but uh, 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 I felt kind of badly when I was <laughs> talking to him this morning because he really wanted to come here. And I think that what we wanted most of all was uh, for him to you know, have a full four years with no college debt. And I think that had a lot to do with it. <laughs> and both boys are leaving college with no debt. And uh, right now, that's a really good thing. So, um, um, <clears throat> let, me, let me start by reading a few paragraphs from Last Child. Many of you have read the book, I, I would guess. But let me start me now, because to me, these paragraphs have become a kind of prayer. And I'm not organized in a religious sense. My wife is very organized, or she goes to church, sometimes I go with her. Um, but I always say the only way I'm getting into heaven is on my wife's guest pass. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> but to me, these words have become a kind of prayer. If when we were young we tramped through forests of Nebraska cottonwoods, or raised pigeons on a rooftop in Queens, or fished for Ozark bluegills, or felt the swell of a wave that traveled a thousand miles before lifting our boat. Then we were bound to the natural world and remain so today. Nature still informs our ears, lifts us, carries us. For children, nature comes in many forms, a newborn cat, a pet that lives and dies, a worn path through the woods, a fort nested in stinging metals, a damp, mysterious edge of a vacant lot. Whatever shape nature takes, it offers each child an older, larger world, separate from parents. Unlike television, nature does not steal time. It amplifies it. Nature offers healing for a child living in a destructive family or neighborhood. It serves as a blank slate upon which a child draws and reinterprets the culture's fantasies. Nature inspires creativity in a child by demanding visualization and the full use of the senses. Given a chance, a child will bring the confusion of the world to the woods, wash it in the creek, turn it over to see what lives on the unseen side of that confusion. Nature can frighten a child, too, and this fright serves a purpose. In nature, a child finds freedom fantasy, and privacy, a place distant from the adult world, a separate peace. These are some of the utilitarian values of nature, but at a deeper level, nature gives itself to children for its own sake, not as a reflection of the culture. At this level, inexplicable nature provokes humility. How many students are here today? How many of you are students? I'm really glad to see you here. I want to talk especially to you tonight. Um, many of you are here t today, this afternoon, because you had a special place in nature. Maybe it was a woods or a field or a place along a stream or a beach, somewhere in nature that was yours. In addition to a special place, you may have had a special person who mentored you who introduced you to nature in the best of ways. Uh, you're more likely to have had a special place than the combination of a special place and special person. If you still have that place in your heart, that is one of the reasons that you're here tonight. 
Uh, my special place in nature was my woods. Uh, I grew up out in Kansas City at the very edge of the su suburbs. I could go out my backyard through uh, the yard, through the hedge, into the cornfield where my underground fort was, and then from there on into the woods and the fields that seemed to go on forever. I spent many of my boyhood years in those woods. Many of those uh, visits to the woods were alone with my dog, who was a collie. It was a real 50s thing. <laughs> <laughs> those woods were my woods. I owned those woods. Those woods were in my heart then, and they're in my heart today. I sometimes go to those woods in my heart. And I find something there that I don't find anywhere else. Uh, as I said, I own those woods to the extent that I think I pulled out hundreds of survey stakes <laughs> that I knew as a year old and had something to do with the bulldozers that were taking out other woods. So I ask you a question. How many here, when you were kids, Hold out survey stakes or something like that. Okay, no, no cameras are watching. Big change is out of office. You can do this I hereby induct you into the secret society of stakeholders. You are stakeholders in that society. By the way, I had a, a developer tell me not long ago that I would have been a lot more effective if I'd simply moved the stakes around. <laughs> Now, I'm not advocating stake bowling uh, much, but um, that, the, the point of that is that those were my woods, those were your places. You know, my woods still exist in my heart, your place still exists in your heart, even though the bulldozers, certainly in my case, finally did come. Um, <laughs> By the way, I, you know, that's not a, that's, that shouldn't be embarrassing to me. I was speaking one time and I forgot to turn my phone off and it started ringing. But here's the deal. I had a cricket sound. In my <laughs> so I kind of looked around. <laughs> Nature. <laughs> um, that feeling of owning a place, of being owned by it, of having your feet on the earth, of having your heart in the earth, of having nature be part of you and you be part of nature and you belong somewhere. And that goes with you as you become an adult. You take that with you all the way through your years then. It seems to me the elemental question here is will future generations of children, what proportion of those generations of children how many of those children will have that place to go to in their heart? Uh, I often tell the story of pulling out stakes, and I told that story last year, I believe it was last year, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, to a very interesting group uh, called the Quivira Coalition. And the Quivira Coalition is a group that's bringing um, uh, ranchers in the West and uh, environmentalists together, and sometimes they are the same thing and they're doing land trusts to protect nature and the ranching uh, uh, culture. After the speech, a rancher stood up, and he was the real deal. His, uh, his uh, genes had not been acid washed. Um, and he stood up, and he was in his 60s, had a white handlebar mustache, and, and the sun burned. And, and he said, you know that story you told about pulling out states? And I said, yes. He said, I did that when I was a boy. And then he began to cry in front of about 500 people, half of whom were wearing cowboy hats. And despite his deep sense of embarrassment, he continued to speak about his deep sense of grief, that his might be one of the last generations to have that kind of sense of ownership of land that has nothing to do with money. And a little while later, another rancher came up to me, and she was a young woman in her 40s, that's young to me now, um, and she said, I, you know, that story told Polastase, I did that too. She said, but I did it different. I did it from my horse.